Good morning and welcome. My name is Rob Litvak and I'm Senior Vice President and Director of International Security Studies here at the Wilson Center. First, I'd like to start by extending our gratitude to each of you for tuning in and to our speakers, Jamie Fly, President and CEO of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and Daisy Sindelar, Vice President and Editor-in-Chief of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, for joining us. <clears throat> Today's event on the legacy, impact, and current challenges faced by RFERL is being held in celebration of the life of our dear friend, Ross Johnson, who sadly passed in February. Before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about Ross. For nearly 15 years, Ross served as a fellow with the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. However, he was far more than a fellow. Ross was a friend, a mentor to many, and a fount of knowledge on all things related to RFERL and the Balkans. He was also an ardent believer in the power of American international broadcasting as a vital tool in supporting democracy and liberty abroad, to which he devoted his life's work. Ross's contributions to the Wilson Center are innumerable, and his impact was not limited to just our history and public policy program. His scholarship has also proven invaluable to the work of the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute, Global Europe Program, the American International Broadcasting Community, and scholars around the world. Ross also, Ross also contributed greatly to our Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, where he served in a variety of senior executive roles from 1988 to 2002, including director of Radio Free Europe, director of the RFERL Research Institute, and acting president and counselor of RFERL. Jamie Fly will discuss Ross's contribution there shortly. I should note that prior to Johnson's career at RFERL, he was a research fellow both at the Rand Corporation then a premier group of analysts studying Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. During his time with the Wilson Center, Ross authored the book Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, subtitled The CIA Years and Beyond, published as part of the Center's series with Stanford University Press. He also wrote numerous papers and blog posts on the history of RFERL and the Balkans and organized a multitude of events. One of those events, a joint Wilson Center and Hoover Institution conference on the impact of Western broadcasting, featured remarks from former US Secretary of State George Shultz and former President of Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel. At one point during his remarks, Havel argued that the quote, influence and significance of RFE RL broadcasts has been great and profound, close quote. Ross could only have agreed. Ross, Ross was also a so-called FOIA, FOIA hound, advocating for the declassification of documents relating to the history of RFERL. In fact, he filed hundreds of FOIA requests, and many of the documents he received are now housed within the Cold War International History Project's digital archive. While at the Hoover Institution, <clears throat> um, uh, before joining the Wilson Center, he also played a pivotal role in making 60 years of records and sound recordings of RFE RL accessible to the public. And while Ross loved to uncover the classified past, he also looked for, toward the future, working to ensure that international broadcasting remained a staple of American soft power. In 2017, he authored a paper critically reviewing the recent restructuring of US international broadcasting. And in 2012, and in a 2012 paper, he, along with the co-author, uh, R. Uh, Eugene Parda laid out a 21st century vision for U.S. global media, applying lessons learned from the Cold War and the post-Cold War period. In it, they suggested changes to bring U.S. international broadcasting up to speed in a rapidly evolving media environment while supporting freedom and democracy abroad. It's hard to quantify the impact that Ross had on many of us here at the Wilson Center, at RFERL, and in Eastern and Central Europe, but I can definitively state that he will be dearly missed and his legacy and immense, pack and immense impact will live on. I'd now like to recognize the director of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, Christian Osterman. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Good morning, everyone. My name 
is Christian Osterman. And as Rob mentioned, I have the privilege of directing the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy mm -hmm. Program. Thank you again for those tuning in. And let me also say a special thank you to our colleagues at the Kennan Institute uh, and the Global Europe Program for co-sponsoring today's event. A shout out to Morgan Jacobs, who played a pivotal role in pulling all of um, this together uh, logistically. Thank you, Morgan. Today's event exploring the legacy and impact of RFERL, uh, as well as uh, the current challenges uh, faced, uh, will be held in memory of our dear colleague, uh, Ross Johnson, who um, passed away recently. I echo what Rob said about Ross's friendship, um, his inspiration to uh, all of us at the Wilson Center and to Ross's really distinguished career and work. Throughout his career, Ross engaged deeply and contributed immensely to several institutions, from the Rand Corporation to RFE, RL, from Hoover to the Wilson Center. Ross, as Rob Rob already hinted at, was a driving force behind a path-breaking October 2004 conference organized by the Wilson Center and the Hoover Institution that brought together international researchers and former government officials to address the impact of Western broadcasting, especially Radio for Europe and Radio Liberties uh, during the Cold War. The materials included uh, secret communist party discussions of broadcasting impact and propaganda countermeasures, secret po police plans to penetrate RFE, directives on jamming and internal secret audience surveys. Many of these materials are now available freely uh, through the Cold War International History Project Digital Archive at the Wilson Center, digitalarchive.org. Ross was also a tireless advocate for the declassification of US documents from the Central Intelligence Agency and other US agencies concerning the history of RFE, filing hundreds of freedom of information and mandatory declassification re review requests. Ross graciously shared many of those documents he obtained as a result of these efforts and helped the Cold War Project, the History and Public Policy Program to establish a collection of over 250 documents about RFE on digitalarchive.org. His untimely death cut short ongoing efforts by Ross to pry loose further US government documentation on the history of RFE. He was in the midst of editing another major document collection for my program's digital archive when he passed away. And we hope to publish this collection later this year in his memory. Several path-breaking collections at the Digital Archive are testament to the pioneering uh, work Ross led thoughtfully, quietly, but persistently to open up the history and legacy of an institution he cared about deeply and profoundly. So we greatly miss him as part of the Cold War Project team. It's so appropriate um, for my RFE colleagues to join us today to commemorate his work. It is my pleasure to be joined today by Jamie Fly, the president and CEO of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, and Daisy Sindelar, the vice president and editor in chief of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. Following remarks by our two speakers, we'll be taking questions from the audience. If you'd like to pose a question, um, you can uh, submit it via email to kenan at wilsoncenter.org. That's K E N N A N at wilsoncenter.org via Twitter at Kennan Institute or on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when sending questions. You can do so right now. You can start getting in line right now. Let me introduce our two speakers. First, Jamie Fly. Jamie Fly resumed his leadership of RFERL as president and chief executive officer on February 16th, 2021 following his reappointment by the RFERL Board of Directors. He was first named RFERL President and Chief Executive Officer on July 10, 2019, effective August 1st that year. Prior to his appointment, he served as a Senior Fellow, Co-Director of the Alliance for 
security, uh, for security democracy and director of future geopolitics and Asia programs at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. He also served as counselor for foreign and national security affairs to Senator Marco Rubio from 2013 to 2017, serving as his foreign policy advisor during his presidential campaign. Before, before joining Senator Rubio's staff in 2013, he served as the executive director of the Foreign Policy Institute uh, from its founding in early 2009. Uh, Mr. Fly also served in the Bush administration at the National Security Council 2008, 2009, and in the office of the Secretary of Defense from 2005 to 2008. His articles and reviews have been published in a wide variety of outlets in the United States and Europe. For his work at the Defense Department, he was awarded the Office of the Secretary of Defense Medal for Exceptional Public Service. Fly received a BA in International Studies and Political Science from American University, and he holds an MA in German and European Studies from Georgetown University. We'll then hear from Daisy Sindelar, who was named Vice President and Editor-in-Chief editor of RFERL in August 2019, served as Acting President in January 2021 and June to December 2020, and from December 2018 to July 2019. Prior to these appointments, she served as director of the Current Time Digital Network, a 24-7 Russian language global network led by RFERL in cooperation with the Voice of America. Desi Sindelar has been with RFERL since February 2001, has contributed in various journalistic and editorial roles within RFE's central newsroom, she advanced from senior correspondent to management role as regional director of the European desk. Prior to joining RFERL, she was managing editor of the Moscow Times and editor in chief of the St. Petersburg Times. She holds a BA in Russian studies from Primor College, Bryn Mawr College, and in addition to completing a postgraduate uh, journalism studies at the University of Florida and advanced Russian language studies at the Herzen Pedagogical Institute in St. Petersburg. It's such a great pleasure to welcome both of you. I think Jamie will start us off. Jamie, over to you. Room, Zoom room is yours. Thanks uh, both to Rob and to Christian and thanks to the Wilson Center for hosting this event today. Uh, as was noted, the Wilson Center was a fantastic home for Ross's endeavors for many years after uh, his, the end of his formal employment with RFERL. And RFERL over the years benefited greatly from the work that he did while he was affiliated with the Wilson Center. And I'll talk more about that in my remarks. Um, it's a great honor to be with everyone today to represent RFERL. As was noted, Ross loved RFERL deeply. Uh, never could leave uh, the business after he ended his formal employment, stayed engaged in the company for years afterwards and conti uh, continued to contribute to our work right up until uh, his passing in February. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our history, but uh, through the lens of Ross's work and some of the contributions that he made to RFERL uh, during uh, his life. Um, and I should just note that my interactions with Ross were fairly recent. I, I met him only two years ago when I first became president of RFERL, and he came to visit me at my office uh, in Washington. But in that brief time in the last two years, I benefited immensely uh, from his knowledge and expertise uh, as he was essentially serving as our de facto in-house uh, historian. Um, history is essential to understanding the work of RFERL even today. Uh, as you'll hear from Daisy, I mean, we are a multimedia news organization providing news and information uh, in 23 countries and 27 languages. But we're a news organization that's very different from most news organizations. We're a news organization with a purpose. That purpose is embodied in our staff uh, here at our headquarters in Prague. 
Uh, it's embodied in our journalists across our 20 bureaus across uh, Eurasia. And all of those journalists and our staff are drawn and have been drawn to the RFERL because in part of our history and their appreciation for that uh, history. And we as a company uh, seek inspiration from that history. Uh, and that history gives us strength and, and resolve to deal with the, the challenging situation that we face today uh, when we look at uh, many of our markets, which uh, are facing significant challenges of democratic decline and attacks on independent media. Our history also shows us that uh, the power of our journalism uh, can change people's lives, uh, can uh, attract an audience that stays with us sometimes uh, for uh, a generation. And in recent years, when we as a company have sought to uh, educate our staff about our history or look for historical parallels that might uh, inform our current work, uh, the person that we would turn to again and again, uh, either over emails, over the phone, on uh, through visits to our headquarters in Prague, or sometimes visits to our bureaus, that person was uh, always Ross. Uh, he would help us commemorate our anniversaries uh, and would be uh, a constant presence whenever we had a historical question uh, or we in management were grappling with how to deal with a current challenge where we felt we might be able to learn something from the past. Ross was a direct living connection to that past and an inspiration uh, to our present work. I was, uh, in preparation for this session today, I was looking at some of the remembrances that people wrote about Ross after his passing. Uh, and it was already noted that he had multiple affiliations uh, I think the, the multiple institutions that wanted to claim Ross uh, after his passing showed uh, the power of his uh, personality, uh, his ability to engage people and maintain uh, relationships over time, uh, and the significant respect that he generated uh, from those relationships that he had with people. I was struck in particular by some remembrances uh, of people who had worked directly for him, which I uh, never had the privilege to do, but uh, several remarked that he was the best boss they, they ever had. Uh, and I think I thought those were impressive uh, recollections of him. Um, and so for my recollections about uh, Ross, I wanted to pick up a couple themes uh, in, in just engagements as I've had with him in the last several years. But I think there are themes that relate to RFRL's history and inform some of our uh, work today. Um, the first is adherence to the truth. Um, this is a powerful theme across RFRL's uh, history because our journalism, ever since our uh, early days, roughly 70 years ago, has always been based on the notion that the audience wants and deserves uh, the truth. Uh, this was the foundation of the initial uh, concept of both Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, which were separate institutions at the time. Basically, the idea that journalists would be given uh, a microphone and allowed uh, to speak to their fellow countrymen who were living in oppression behind the Iron Curtain, unfiltered. Uh, those journalists promised in their initial broadcast, and Ross often helped us unearth uh, and, and even in some cases maintain uh, the original broadcasts. Those broadcasts promised their audiences the truth. They promised uh, that uh, they would not abandon those audiences, that they would be there by their side on a consistent basis, providing objective news and information. And that's what uh, those journalists did for decades. They attracted an audience with those simple promises uh, the, that audience came uh, to listen to them often on a daily basis through the static of uh, jamming of governments that were trying to block that message from reaching their citizens. And even to this day, I still, as president of RFERL, meet uh, people who are now uh, advanced in years, but remember fondly as children uh, listening with their families to the broadcast of Radio Free Europe uh, or Radio Liberty, and they can attest to the central role uh, that those outlets played in their uh, lives. 
Um, that history created an amazing brand loyalty, which we've accumulated over decades and it remains powerful today across many of our markets. And it's needed more than ever, as, as Daisy will discuss, uh, because of the spread of disinformation and the declining trust that uh, many audiences have in media outlets uh, in their countries across uh, Eurasia. Um, after uh, Ross retired from RFE, his scholarship at places like Wilson was dedicated to ensuring that the stories about this period, the early years of RFERL, uh, remained uh, in, in the public domain, that information that was previously not accessible was revealed to scholars and to those of us still at the company. Um, and he also spent a significant amount of time trying to make sure that uh, the truth about RFERL's operations during this period could be shared with future generations. He played a key role in correcting the record on several important issues about those early years of RFERL. Uh, his book, which was mentioned earlier, uh, looked in particular at the role played by the Central Intelligence Agency in the early years of the organization, uh, which uh, its role at the time uh, was not publicly discussed, but was later revealed uh, several decades later uh, by uh, the US Congress. Uh, using declassified documents that he worked uh, to get released, uh, he showed that that role, which uh, in, in uh, popular imagination had been deemed to be very engaged, uh, very prescriptive about the journalism, was not what RFERL's critics had claimed it to be, and outlined that, in fact, uh, the intelligence community, uh, although it provided funding, uh, was not on a regular basis trying to intervene in the day-to-day -day coverage of the radios. Uh, he did this, as I mentioned, through uh, efforts to declassify information. And uh, I think after taking office several months in, I was actually handed a letter by one of my staff to the CIA asked, and asked to sign it. And I asked, why in the world am I trying to get some information from the CIA? And I was told, oh, this is a project that Ross is working on. And he uh, would like RFERL support to try to declassify more documents. And so he was engaged in this work uh, even in recent years. He also played an important role in recent years, uh, establishing relations with several institutions, uh, Hoover uh, and the Blinken uh, Institute in Budapest, which housed uh, RFERL's archives. He made connections for senior management, including myself as I traveled so I could also meet with archivists uh, who had access to our records. Uh, and he was a, a critical piece of the company's efforts in recent years to make sure that we could preserve as much information as possible about our early years. Similarly, uh, he looked at several crises uh, that RFERL had covered during the Cold War period, uh, most notably RFERL's role surrounding the 1956 Hungarian uh, uprising. Uh, which had also taken on a life of its own uh, in popular imagination. And RFERL, RFE at that period, was, uh, was accused of some transgressions in its coverage. He looked at this issue, again, using information that had not been publicly available before, and he helped rebut a lot of that anti-RFE propaganda, some of which we've actually seen resurface in recent years as uh, RFERL has returned to Hungary. And his scholarship played a key role in allowing us to be able to reveal the facts about what was actually happening during that important period in Hungary. A second theme I wanted to highlight about Ross's legacy is the independence of RFERL. Um, he was a persistent advocate for RFERL's independence, despite the fact that it is funded by the US taxpayer. He knew from his time in RFE management how essential RFERL's independence is to the credibility that we retain with our audience. He also understood that despite the statutory protections that enshrine RFERL's independence in US law, that uh, active efforts by RFE and uh, now RFERL management uh, were always necessary to protect and preserve that independence and to ensure that our journalists had the space to follow the news wherever it led them and that US government officials did not try to insert themselves into our work. 
He consistently argued for more legal protections to make the job of those of us in our material management easier on this front and to protect our journalists from the retribution that often comes in the countries we operate where they're often accused of being uh, foreign agents or, or spies. Uh, and I should also note that uh, he played a key role in advising us in management about how to tackle uh, tough issues when we were covering our own country, the, the country of the taxpayers that fund us, because I think he realized that uh, it's not just the statutory protections uh, in law that protect our FERL, but it's our day-to-day -day journalism and how we show our audiences that we are truly independent and that we adhere to the highest, highest standards of objective journalism. Just last year, uh, Daisy and I actually reached out to Ross uh, at a time when there were tumultuous events in the United States around the killing of George Floyd. Uh, and we were trying to make sure that our coverage of those events was appropriate, was unbiased. Uh, and we reached out to Ross, um, not to direct our day-to-day -day coverage now, but to ask him about parallels to the past uh, during previous moments, like the tumultuous 1960s in the US and how RFE and Radio Liberty at the time had covered those events. And, and as usual, uh, I always knew that if I needed to reach out to Ross and like that within several hours, I'd get a, a response, which would be illuminating and help shed some light on uh, the web uh, for the company. Um, in his final months, he was once again engaged in uh, advocacy to strengthen our protections for the company in law. Uh, he was briefing congressional staff. Uh, he was in touch with the transition team for the incoming Biden administration. Uh, and just as he was diagnosed with the illness that led to his death, uh, he was helping to pen an open letter from former RFERL uh, presidents to then President-elect Biden about the importance of independence for Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. So this was a mission he was literally engaged in uh, to the very end of his life. The final theme I wanted to highlight uh, related to Ross's impact on RFERL is um, innovation and, and reinvention. He was a senior executive at the company from 1988 to 2002. This was a critical moment in the company's history. And without uh, innovative leadership during this period, the radios might not even exist uh, to this day. Uh, there was significant pressure uh, here in the, uh, back in the US, in Congress, uncertainty about our mission uh, at headquarters in Munich, which was our Cold War headquarters. Uh, and there was an existential debate really about the future of these institutions, which had contributed to the end of the Cold War, but seemed to lack uh, a current purpose. Uh, Ross in his role in the company helped plot its post-Cold War path he negotiated with newly elected Democratic leaders, many of whom had been listeners or contributors to uh, the language services in their uh, countries. He helped negotiate the opening of bureaus in these newly democratic countries. And he laid the groundwork for the company's current forward deployed uh, posture of placing journalists wherever possible out in the field side by side with their fellow citizens who they serve on a daily uh, basis. I should also note that through his interactions with these, uh, these uh, post-Cold War leaders, uh, Ross played a key role in highlighting some of their commentary about the power of the radios during the Cold War. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, Václav Havel's quote, well, we have now commentary from Václav Havel, like Valenza, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev about the power of the radios. Uh, many of, of those engagements were either with Ross or because of uh, programs that Ross convened to interview leaders on the other side of the Iron Curtain about the role that the radio played during this period. Uh, those relationships, and one in particular with Václav Havel, helped lay the groundwork for the company's move to Prague, where we're headquartered now. Uh, the move happened in 1995 after Havel invited uh, RFERL to move to Prague. And Ross essentially, through, that, uh, through the negotiation of that move and the path he put the radios on at the time, saved the radios from extinction. 
And without the foresight that he and his colleagues, I think, showed, uh, it's very likely that the radio would have shuttered, uh, given the sense that the Cold War was over and they were no longer uh, needed. And events, unfortunately, in recent decades have shown that keeping the radios alive was the right choice and invigorating, invigorating them with a uh, new purpose has allowed new generations to continue to engage uh, with their uh, content. Um, I should note that on this front, I had some interactions with Ross in the last several years, as unfortunately, RFERL was asked to return to some of the old markets. And I even had some discussions with Ross, as I, in 2019, was visiting Budapest, for instance, where we eventually relaunched our Hungarian service because Ross had visited uh, Budapest uh, to actually open up our bureau after the events of 1989. And uh, he was able to share some of his experiences from that period as we then returned uh, to that uh, market. Um, the history of the radios are one of constant innovation and reinvention. And we'll really feel Ross's loss in the months ahead as we deal with difficult new challenges. And Daisy will talk about that, especially in Russia, uh, where I know we would have turned to him for his sage counsel and advice. Our predecessors at RFERL, including Ross, worked in incredibly difficult circumstances, uncertain during uncertain times, and they often helped make the impossible possible. As I noted at the beginning, their legacy keeps attracting journalists year after year to RFERL today and gives us the strength uh, to carry on no matter what current challenges are thrown at us. We'll forever be grateful to Ross for all of these ways that he influenced the company and made sure that we can continue to be relevant for our audiences for many years to come. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, <clears throat> let me um, emphasize uh, uh, your point. I don't think there is, there, there are very few institutions that have as radically opened up their, rec their own record um, as uh, RFERL has. Um, and uh, this is thanks to Rob, and I think uh, is, is absolutely central to um, RFERL's stature and, and, and the brand, as you said, brand of truth. Um, let me, before I turn the Zoom room over to uh, Daisy, uh, remind our listeners, viewers, um, that you can submit uh, questions in a variety of ways. You can email uh, us at kennan at wilsoncenter.org. That's K-E-N-N-A-N at wilsoncenter.org. You can reach us via Twitter at at Kennan Institute, or you can uh, contact us on our Facebook page. That's the Kennan Institute's Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when sending questions or comments um, or uh, tributes um, to Ross. And with that, Daisy, the Zoom room is yours. A warm welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christian. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, too, to the Wilson Center and the Kennan Institute for organizing this conversation today. I think it has been an incredibly tumultuous year for everybody, um, and RFP is no exception. It's very nice to take the opportunity to calmly reflect on a really remarkable person and a, and a remarkable life. I think it's been wonderful to hear so many interesting details about his life uh, and his scholarship. And from a personal perspective, sitting here in Prague among my colleagues at RFERL, I think it's, I'd really like to share with all of you too, uh, how much he's going to be missed at RFERL. He was a gentleman. He knew the history of our organization intimately. And so many of our journalists thought of him as uh, a man, uh, a friend, and uh, a colleague for whom they had really deep respect. So he is missed. And I think as Jamie noted, we very often turn to him at moments of uh, profound reflection um, when we were dealing with a, a conflict or a concern of some kind, just to have some reassurance that uh, what may seem new to us is in fact uh, ingrained in our history and very often repeating itself. And there was comfort in that. It's unfortunate that we don't have him here uh, with us because we will have uh, opportunity for many of those questions going forward. 
Um, I really liked the note that Jamie ended on about uh, Ross's um, important role in innovation and reinvention at RFERL, because that was the note that I wanted to start on today to talk about uh, where RFE is at this moment. And uh, as Christian noted in the introductory remarks, I've been with the company for 20 years, so I really have seen a certain development arc in the organization. And what has really been remarkable for me is how rapidly uh, the company has evolved and changed over what I would say is the past five to seven years. And that's really in terms of its astounding new capacity for visual programming. Um, and how many of our hundreds of frontline reporters have really used this to solidify uh, our brand as a source of objective news and information in the countries where we work. So uh, for a company that has radio in its name, not once, but twice, uh, we really have made an astonishing leap forward in, in television and video reporting capacities. And that really had its origins in the founding of Current Time Television, which was created in October 2014 in response to the Russian invasion of Crimea, where we began to realize that there were large pockets of Russian speakers outside of the Russian Federation who had only one source of news and information if they wanted to be consuming uh, news in Russian, and that was through state-run channels. And so with the creation of Current Time, we were trying to depoliticize the Russian language by creating a media outlet that would be speaking to Russia, uh, Russian speakers worldwide, but providing them with objective news and information that they decidedly were not going to be getting uh, from channels controlled by the Kremlin. Um, but Current Time was just a start. Uh, it's a 24-7 channel, but really every single one of the language services that RFERL works with um, has picked up visual programming capacities uh, at an astounding rate, even those that remain quite dependent for market realities on radio like Afghanistan, for example. So at the current moment, we have uh, studio facilities in Prague, Bishkek, Kiev, Yerevan, Chisinau, and Sarajevo. And then we will have some kind of visual capacities in nearly every country where we work. Uh, even our very newest, smallest services, uh, as Jamie mentioned, we've returned to Central Europe. So we will have visual reporting capacities in uh, Bucharest, in Budapest, and in Sofia. Even in Iran, where we have no physical presence, we are able to commission very successfully uh, reporting and um, video programming shot inside Iran, which is a real rarity and an exceptional value for our audiences. And so we are always building on our skills to create greater interconnectivity between our bureaus and between Prague and all of our bureaus. This means that you know, we are striving to build what is really going to be one of the largest reporting capacities um, in a very underreported and a very misreported part of the world. And in the meantime, we've been, uh, thanks to our development in these visual capacities, we've really been at the front line, real eyewitnesses to what has been an absolutely astonishing period of history in the countries where we work. So the conflict in Eastern Ukraine, uh, Armenia's uh, Velvet Re Revolution in 2018, and of course it's, um, it's a political crisis that's unfolding right now this year. This whole past year has seen incredibly vivid reporting from hospitals, from cemeteries, uh, from family members about COVID. And remember, we are talking about a part of the world where COVID was virtually buried, uh, pronounced non-existent or a falsehood in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and other countries where we work. So this kind of immediate reporting was absolutely vital to getting essential health information out to audiences in the countries where we work. And of course, there was an incredibly restive period in Russia over the past year, um, and that continues up until this moment. I did want to try to show a clip. I'm not, uh, my, my tech, technical acumen tends to dissolve at moments of public presentation. Let's give it a chance. Uh, let's see if it works. This is um, a collection of clips from live news reporting that we were doing uh, both at the time that Alexei Navalny was returning to Russia 
following his uh, his recovery from an attempted poisoning. But it shows you the the on the ground capacities that we have inside Russia uh, when reporting gets really very rough. Российский оппозиционный политик Алексей Навальный делал селфи, в этом он не отказывал, раздавал автографы. Я ничего не боюсь, и вас призываю ничего не бояться. Спасибо. Добрый день, скажите, пожалуйста, страшно ли вам здесь? Добрый день! Не успел молодой человек ответить. Я очень рада, что такое большое количество людей выходит по всей нашей стране, в разных уголках нашей Родины. Подождите. Мы вам не мешаем, мы вам не мешаем. Нет. Физически, физически сотрудники ОМОН вытесняют журналистов, чтобы мы не могли, чтобы не дать нам возможности снимать задержание и показывать в прямом эфире, как эти задержания здесь проходят. Мы оказались в самом эпицентре этих задержаний, просто потому что толпа протестующих оказалась заперта между Большой Дмитровкой и Петровкой. Человек находится в сознании, но очевидно, что ему довольно плохо. Судя по жилету, это сотрудник... Прессы. Вот избивают дубинками молодых людей, бьют по голове, по всем частям тела. Очень, очень жесткий разгон. Он до сих, он до сих пор лежит. Его избивают дубинками. Прижимаю за то, что в этой ситуации меня могут обвинить еще. Сделать виновным. Просто даже если это так случится, я не удивлюсь. Укивают дубинками, Ш толкают в шею, да, их в грудь. Толкает внутрь. Какие эмоции ты у вас вызывает, что вы не собирались никуда идти, а вас задерживают? Я вам честно скажу, с завтрашнего дня я по-другому буду смотреть на этот мир. Даже можно сказать прямо сейчас уже, что я уже по-другому буду смотреть. Saw it that time. Okay. Apologies again. Um, so that's just an example of the kind of reporting that we're able to do now quite credibly inside Russia. And it's worth saying that, you know, that was primarily in Moscow, but we really have a network that works throughout the entire country. And I do think it's safe to say that reporting like that is precisely the reason that we are facing the current challenges that we are inside Russia. Um, that uh, our coverage of Navalny's return to Russia, uh, including his ride home on the airplane, his detention and the protests that followed, got 42 million views on social media in Russia, which is an extraordinary audience, particularly because we know we are reaching younger generations of Russians inside the country. Um, so, the reason that I wanted to begin by talking about visual programming, which is a bit of an outlier when we're talking about uh, an organization with the history that RFE has, is because it has been incredibly important for us for two key reasons. And one is that it travels very easily over digital platforms. I mentioned that we have that huge audience inside Russia. In some places, we have traditional access uh, to the airwaves, increasingly not so much in Russia, barely at all. And so digital is really critical to our success in reaching our audiences in meaningful numbers in countries that definitely do not see us as an attractive media option. Um, and the second thing, perhaps even more importantly, is what a brand builder this is on um, the immediacy of those images and the connection with the audiences, particularly when we go live, is something that has been really extraordinary for us. And I have to say, and I'm sure that Jamie would concur, that one of the greatest pleasures of working for RFE is when you get an opportunity, and I hope that we all go back to this life soon, to travel to one of the countries where we work or a place where we have a bureau and really see firsthand uh, the name recognition that we get, uh, the, the facial recognition that our journalists have and the profound appreciation of our work on the ground. And this kind of street credibility that you see in reporting like this, it confers a huge amount of legitimacy, intimacy, and integrity. So Jamie was talking about the importance of adherence to the truth, very often being able to show firsthand that you're witnessing what your audience in the country is witnessing themselves is incredibly powerful and has been a really fantastic tool for us in countering disinformation in a lot of the countries where we work. So 
of course, now we're, we're bearing the consequences of some of this, and we're speaking to you at a moment when all of this is under threat uh, as a result of our current persecution under Russia's foreign agent law. We were first designated uh, as a foreign agent in 2017. It has come with a, uh, an escalating a series of, of penalties and uh, obligations, uh, financial and otherwise, uh, which really culminated in a red line that we weren't able to cross, uh, which was forcing us to label extensively every individual piece of content that would be going out across any platform to a Russian audience. Part of our success in Russia is that we have multiple brands. We have a series of community sites that are meant for regional audiences in addition to current time and our classic Russian series of Russia, Russian service, um, Radio Svoboda, and uh, not to mention platforms in Tatar, in Bashkir, and in Chechen. Uh, and so our ability to reach our audiences is multiplied if you think about the use of social media and we're really being asked to label every individual piece of content. It is something that was so onerous uh, that we knew we would be losing our digital audience virtually overnight. Uh, and we were not going to bow to pressure from the media watchdog in Russia that would uh, force us to self-label in a way that is basically acknowledging criminal intent. It would be intimidating to audiences. It runs absolutely counter to our mission, which is to engage meaningfully with our audiences. Um, so Russia is just a case in point. I'm happy to answer questions about it um, in the Q&A section as Jamie is, I'm sure. But you know, it's it's worth noting that it's 30 years ago this year that we were first given an ability to work legally inside Russia when Yeltsin uh, produced an edict that allowed us to form our first bureau inside Russia. Uh, it's quite sad that we're finding ourselves in a position where we are really constrained in terms of our ability to remain there safely and legally, although we are determined to do so. Those of you who are following the news in Eastern Europe and elsewhere know that Russia is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the situation in Belarus over the past year has been extremely grim. Um, the, the, uh, the, the protests that followed the, um, the extremely compromised presidential election there last year um, got fantastic coverage from our journalists, but also led to a crackdown on the part of Belarusian authorities who used uh, the, de the deprivation of accreditations and other methods to basically make journalism illegal. We are no longer able to work uh, openly on the street. And those same tactics are gonna play out in greater or lesser form across a number of countries where we work. Central Asia is very vulnerable to this type of pr uh, pressure against journalists. We also have difficult situations in Afghanistan where I'm sure all of you uh, are aware of the um, the very depressing uptick in violence uh, as a, a political deal with the Taliban grows more likely. We unfortunately lost one of our colleagues, a reporter in Afghanistan last year. So we are constantly having to recalibrate the way we work in all of our countries. This for us in a way is nothing new. We have lost um, our physical presence in a number of countries where we work or we have never had it in the case of Iran. Um, but we have lost bureaus in Azerbaijan, in Uzbekistan, uh, Pakistan, and, uh, and yet the work there continues to be quite meaningful, albeit it is always an operational challenge. So my assignment for the, the, our gathering today was to talk a little bit about the present and the future. They're really intertwined, they are, and they rest on two immediate principles. Uh, one is being forced on us, the other would have happened regardless, but has become uh, more and more urgent as a result of the, the operational crises we're facing in so many places. So one is, how do we stay operational in countries that no longer want us to be there? Uh, how do we remap our journalistic strategy for the long term? Um, and the second is a full-scale move to what we're calling digital-centric programming. It's quite clear that digital is uh, the future, I think, the, um, uh, the COVID pandemic sort of made that inevitable and uh, the pressures that we're facing in a number of our countries also make it quite necessary. So 
you know, I've, I've talked about Russia, Belarus, Central Asia, uh, Iran, and Afghanistan. It's, it, it would be good to have Ross here at this moment, but it seems to me that I've never, uh, I can't in my own recollection remember a time when there's been greater pressure on RFERL's operations in the countries where it works uh, than it's having right now. And this does mean that the nature of operating a journalistic organization is changing as well. So it used to be that we were very focused on uh, craft, technique, platform, standards, ethics, and all of those things are still important. In fact, they're doubly important uh, at a time when we're coming under profound reputational challenge. But now we also have to take into consideration phys physical security, digital security, uh, the ability to be able to provide payment, equipment, legal support to our journalists, um, our ability to relocate journalists very quickly uh, at moments of extreme pressure and always being able to provide reporters with tools and training that they need for secure communications and secure reporting and ways to securely deliver their content. Um, a large part of what we do now is not only protecting the security of our journalists, but protecting the security of our audiences. We work in places like Turkmenistan, where even showing that you have branded content from RFERL can uh, lead to extraordinary pressure. So we do a lot of communicating with our audience about how they can safely and discreetly receive our content through the use of VPNs and circumvention tools like Siphon. So as we move on to our digital future, um, it's worth noting that for the first time uh, last year in October, 2020, we hired a head of digital strategy. Uh, he got here just in time. Um, and what he's really been focused on in large part is uh, taking the organization that we are and creating a more agile uh, approach to workflow. Those of you who are working with digital and all of us are, you see how quickly trends come and go, how quickly tools evolve and how important it is to stay on top of those tools. And so we are using um, our head of digital strategy to really focus in on creating these agile workflows, but also teaching journalists a new way to think about what journalism is. It is no longer journalists speaking to an audience about what the journalists determine is important. It really is much more about a conversation between audiences and journalists. So we are putting a new emphasis on ways of engaging with audiences, letting audiences to some, de to some degree determine the types of coverage that they're interested in. Uh, more community management. I talked about the community sites that we have inside Russia, creating those special communities within a country or within a demographic is not only a fantastic trust builder, it is one of the best ways to build audiences uh, inside hard to reach countries. We talk more and more about using user generated content. We've used this quite successfully in closed countries uh, to get very vivid coverage um, from audiences who are quite adept at using cell phones to capture content. Uh, and we're talking about things like digital forensics and just using data mining tools and artificial intelligence to do very meaningful on the, on the ground color reporting in the absence of uh, working openly in the field the way we may not be able to quite as easily going forward. So all of these things are moving RFERL away from what we would call the traditional media model, which is a very, uh, it's very heavy on the content provider. We're moving a lot more towards the back end, basically the, the teams and tools that are going into supporting that audience engagement, the tools and technologies that we need to stay connected in, in, in um, reporting environments and delivery environments that are changing all the time. Uh, so this, in many ways, is no different than what you're reading about uh, happening at the Washington Post and other media organizations. A lot of people are making shifts in this direction. I think the exception for us might be that we are continuing to work in some of the most closed countries on Earth. Um, and in the main, working with native in-country journalists who are the very best at what they do, but also extremely vulnerable to pressure. Um, so. A couple of things that we talk about a lot in terms of the journalism that we're doing going forward, 
uh, I'll just say very briefly, we have expanded our range to really focus on China. Um, Chinese influence has become as pernicious as Russian disinformation campaigns in a lot of the countries where we work, uh, particularly in Eurasia, but also in the Balkans and Belarus. Uh, we have, over the past year, made tremendous strides in our investigative reporting. This is one of the best ways to really focus a lens on the devastating consequences of corruption in our part of the world. Uh, we, we did a series of investigative reports last year, uh, perhaps the most successful of which was a series of reports from Kyrgyzstan, where a very high placed customs official was responsible for a money laundering operation that was taking hundreds of thousands, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars out of um, state coffers, uh, out of school funding, out of everything that this very poor country needs and, and laundering it outside of the country. This report, which we did together with Bellingcat and OCCRP, um, resulted in an incredibly tumultuous election season inside Kyrgyzstan. It also put the former customs official on a U.S. sanctions list um, and has been cited in a number of U.S. State Department reports. So for the, us, that is real impact, where we can tell a story meaningfully to a local audience, but also raise awareness about what can seem like a very remote instance of corruption for uh, our stakeholders in Washington and elsewhere. Increasingly, we're focusing on issues like migration, uh, minority issues. Um, we are trying to improve our reporting capacities around Russia, and that will include new bureaus, ideally in places like Osh and the Fergana Valley, where we can really bring together several different Central Asian teams for meaningful reporting. Um, and always using our engagement uh, tools to build trust in an audience that is coming to us primary, primarily through social. They have a buffet of options in front of us, in front of them, and we have to not only introduce them to our brand, remind them of our values, but constantly be communicating with them about who we are, what our legacy is, and what our, our values are. And I will close by saying that, of course, one of the big issues that we're working on now is developing our podcasts. Um, we have about, uh, we have more than 100 podcasts at the moment, although a lot of this is basically downloadable audio and not the podcasts that those of you who listen to The Daily, et cetera, are probably used to. Um, and we're also doing a great deal of audio streaming. And so this is important on the one hand because it takes us back to our roots. Um, our, our talent for radio is always going to be valid and always going to be important. And because uh, we're gathered today to talk about Ross, I'm uh, especially happy that we have kept an emphasis on these audio products because it allows us to dip into this rich trove of audio archives that Ross was so essential and so central in protecting and preserving. So we are working hard to digitize our, our, our audio archives for use in podcasts and audio programs going forward. When we relaunched our service to Hungary last year, uh, they, they began with a series of podcasts that dipped right into that content that was being held in Budapest. And so that's a, it's a remarkable way to teach new audiences about a very uh, honorable history and that's um, that we have here at RFERO. So I will close there, thanks. Thanks so much, Daisy, for fascinating uh, remarks. Um, before we uh, go to some of the um, audience questions, and again, you can join that conversation by submit submitting an email to kennan at wilsoncenter.org or via Twitter at Kennan Institute or to the Kennan Institute's Facebook page. I'd like to read um, a statement by um, James Gow, Professor James Gow uh, at King's College London, where he teaches international peace and security with an emphasis on Eastern Europe, a former Wilson Center fellow who reminds us that Ross was also part of a large global scholarly community um, in one of his many capacities. Um, uh, James writes, um, that Ross was not just important to RFERL and other institutions, but he was also a doyen of Yugoslav studies 
And in the transformation of communist revolution, he wrote one of the most important studies on communism, communism getting how Belgrade responded to Moscow spot on and so, and so informing so much else in the passage of the Cold War and its unraveling. And beyond all of that, he was not only a brilliant scholar, but one of the sweetest, kindest, most supportive figures any of us could encounter in our academic development. Thank you, James. Now to the questions we've, uh, that have been coming in. Um, let me start um, with a question from uh, Jeff Trimble, former acting president of RFERL. Thanks to the visions and persistence of Ross and others, RFERL continues its vital work in an environment where democracy and freedom of speech and media increasingly are imperiled. Question, Ross and his colleagues creatively and successfully attacked the challenge of radio jam jamming. What is your strategy for countering increasing internet censorship including moves by Russia and other countries to establish sovereign internet regimes, more or less cut off from the World Wide Web. Uh, Jamie, I, would you like to sure. that? I'll, I'll start. And uh, I'm glad Jeff, uh, Jeff started off with the easy question. Um, <clears throat> no, but it's a vital question because as Daisy noted, uh, an increasing amount of our audience is uh, engaging with content online. And we still do some radio in some of our markets, uh, but it's a very different sort of challenge when governments uh, try to weaponize the internet to uh, defend their own interests, um, to, su to suppress their people. We've seen increasing uses of internet outages and shutdowns at key moments in countries when protests are taking place. Uh, we saw this, I uh, believe, just last year uh, in Iran uh, for a number of days where the country's entire internet is basically taken out. Uh, and when the internet is the primary platform for our language services to engage with our audience, uh, obviously you then have to move to either uh, old fashioned means, uh, go back to other platforms, or you need to rely on technology to help you circumvent those outages. We've benefited immensely uh, from being part of the family of entities that are funded by the Congress through the U.S. Agency for Global Media, uh, in part because one of our partners there is, is what is called the Open Technology Fund, which uh, funds advanced technology to help break through uh, this modern day censorship and uh, helps provide RFERL and the other networks with some of the tools that can be used to circumvent uh, internet shutdowns. And so I think we're gonna increasingly have to turn to that sort of technology uh, in uh, the future when we have authoritarian regimes that are trying to block us from accessing uh, the audience. But I see that problem only increasing. I think the other thing, and you might wanna talk more about this, she touched on a few minutes ago is we are redoubling our efforts to ensure that our engagement with our audiences is quality engagement online. Uh, it's very easy in the digital age to just throw content out as a content provider, uh, wait for people to click on it uh, or view it once, but we are making sure that we are bringing in a modern day audience that is in many respects similar to the audience, the loyal audience, that uh, was attracted to us in decades past uh, for uh, sustained engagement. And sustained engagement is increasingly difficult in the digital era uh, because brand loyalty has declined in many markets. Um, but there are ways that you can make sure that the content you provide is uh, reaching an audience in a way that encourages them to interact with that content and to come back from, for more in the future. And so we're uh, spending a lot of time within the company trying to think about our audience engagement in the digital, digital space. And I think that will also be key because even if there are then roadblocks thrown in front of the audience as they try to access the content, they'll be more committed to uh, using circumvention tools, VPNs and other tools to still find ways to access the content in a modern day version of the way that our audience would literally sit and uh, sit there by the radio 
and turn the dial uh, to try to get break through the static and find the one frequency that was not being jammed. Uh, we want to make sure that we have audience members that are willing to put in the time and effort to engage with our content in the same way if their governments are trying to deprive them of access to the content. Thank you. Daisy, do you want to chime in on this or? Um... I had not much to add other than to say that in, you know, in a lot of the countries where we work, there is, there are always going to be social media platforms that are available to audiences. So they may go after the Western giants, but there will be homegrown platforms. So a lot of what we do is diversify our portfolio, make sure that we're getting out on as many different platforms uh, as possible. Um, with the aim of ensuring that at least some of that is getting through to the audience. And then just to pick up on what Jamie was saying, you know, building that sustainable relationship with an audience is tricky, regardless of whether you're, uh, you know, there's a crackdown underway on the part of the Kremlin against your work, uh, simply because there are so many things to choose from. And one of the things that uh, we're looking to do increasingly is forge a connection with our audience, not only in terms of them making the suggestions for so uh, story coverage, um, but really raising a generation of citizen or community journalists inside countries. So these are not necessarily employees, but people who share the values of the organization and are on the ground and seeing interesting stories themselves. So we're very lucky in the sense that we have um, committed outside partners that support us when it comes to uh, digital training for young potential journalists in the field. Um, and what we have noticed in Russia and elsewhere is that there are uh, entire generations of people who are not interested in leaving the country, are interested in reporting the truth on what's happening inside the country. And so that is a relationship that we're, you know, going to continue nurturing uh, to the best of our ability because it really is a lifeline. Thank you. We have a question from another uh, RFERL veteran, Robert Gillette. For Jamie, how would you distinguish between RFERL's purpose and VOAs uh, in these times? Another, another important question. Um, we're part of a uh, family of congressionally funded broadcast and networks. Uh, as I mentioned before, with the Open Technology Fund, we're all funded by appropriations through the, from the US Congress through the US Agency for Global Media. Um, Voice of America is one of those networks, but it's a, a federal uh, network. Um, so VOA journalists are federal employees, whereas uh, RFERL and uh, Radio Free Asia and Middle East Broadcasting Network are all private entities uh, and we're, have been made very clear in the uh, congressional statutes over the years that Congress views the important, it to be important that these networks remain private non-governmental entities. So there is that federal private distinction just inherent in the way that we're structured compared to Voice of America. Uh, Voice of America is an important partner of RFERL, uh, as was noted uh, earlier with our current time, uh, channel for Russia. Uh, that's a joint project. We have several other joint initiatives with Voice of America. Um, but Voice of America's mission has always been slightly different. Uh, its mission has been primarily to uh, tell America's story, to portray to a foreign audience uh, news and information about what is going on inside the United States, what U.S. officials are talking about, what is happening in the U.S. Congress or in the executive branch. Uh, related to policy uh, that affects some of the countries that they broadcast to. We have some language services that overlap uh, where we have both a Voice of America service and an RFERL service uh, in, in both countries. And then there are obviously large parts of the world where VOA is the only US uh, international broadcaster. So I think um, for me, the, the important distinction has been that uh, role that VOA provides in talking about what's going on inside the United States, showing the United States to the world. And that's important in our case because we don't have much of a presence inside the United States. We have a small office in Washington, a handful of journalists there, um, but we cannot effectively cover what is happening inside the United States ourselves. And so we often rely on a lot of Voice of America coverage uh, for our language services as, as they provide some news and information to their audiences about what's going on inside the United States. Thank you. 
a question from uh, Brian Rosborough, Managing Director of Original Pursuit. Is there a radio-free China? If not, should there be a collaborative venture with reciprocal broadcasts in both countries? Not for US government propaganda, but a digital platform for joint ventures. We'd like to take that on. I can briefly, so there is a, a Radio Free Asia, uh, which is another non-governmental network uh, that actually was modeled on Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. It, it came uh, decades after RFERL was established. So Radio Free Asia uh, broadcasts uh, to China and to other parts of East Asia and plays that, that role that the questioner uh, described. Um, we occasionally partner with Radio Free Asia increasing in Central Asia on some projects uh, because as Daisy noted, it's been an increased priority for RFERL to also cover the China story in our coverage area and in many parts of our market, especially in Central Asia, China is playing an increasingly controversial role. And so we sometimes tap into um, joint reporting that's done with Radio Free Asia, which has played an important role, for instance, in exposing uh, the genocide against uh, the Uyghurs uh, in uh, Western China and some of our Central Asian services have done groundbreaking reporting about the impact uh, of detention camps on ethnic uh, Kazakhs and others in Central Asia who have been pulled into that horrible situation. Uh, and so there is a, a US funded network that plays that role. And I think uh, that network is going to be increasingly important in the years ahead, uh, given the challenges that uh, the United States faces uh, with a, a rising China. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Professor Andreas Andrianopoulos, former Wilson Center fellow as well. What is the situation today of Radio for Europe in terms of dealing with the Russian Federation? Based on its background experience, what can RFERL do to encourage US-Russia rapprochement and avoid a possible Russia-China front and a new Cold War? Daisy, do you wanna take that on? Uh, I actually, I think that's a more appropriate um, question for Jamie, but you know, mentioning, one of the things that makes the relationship with VOA important is because it does give uh, unique access to not only political developments inside the United States, but also ordinary life. And I think that that is a great humanizing force um, when we're talking about audiences in Russia who are pummeled day and night with state-run media that villainizes every aspect of life inside the United States at the moment. Um, and so, programming like that can be extremely important. Um, but beyond that, I would just say that the practice of free and fair information and the dissemination and practice of open journalism is the biggest selling point when it comes to talking about uh, improved relationships between uh, Russia and the United States. And, um, but we're up against something extremely tough. Um, the uh, I'm sure as some of you noticed, Russia just announced that it's too foreign enemies are the United States and the Czech Republic, which puts uh, RFE pretty squarely in the crosshairs. And so we're at a moment when relationships are really uh, at a profound low. And so uh, it is, and, and we're very much caught up in that story as well. So uh, it's, we are determined to continue reporting, reporting openly and fairly, um, but we are really up against something quite challenging at the moment. Perhaps Jamie would like to say something yeah. more. Jamie? No, I think I think Daisy uh, highlighted an important point. I guess the, the brief answer is we're, we're trying to play that role. I think our programming has the potential to play that role to bring Russians closer to the United States. Um, we also help the Russian audience learn more about themselves, which I think is important to highlight as well. And Although we've talked a lot about the political coverage uh, that we do, uh, some of our most effective journalism from inside Russia is about non-political issues. And some of our most popular uh, work is about local issues, day-to-day -day issues that affect people's lives in a way that politics often does not. And all of that now 
is being threatened uh, because of the weaponization of this uh, foreign agent law by the Kremlin and the targeting, not just as, of us, but of uh, small independent media outlets as well that are not funded by the US government. Um, we've seen a steady increase in recent weeks, unfortunately, in uh, the addition of new uh, news organizations to the foreign agent list, which for years had only RFERL entities and then Voice of America on it. And, and so now we face a real crisis for independent media inside Russia. And I think it's going to be incredibly difficult for the rapprochement that the questioner uh, mentioned to occur in that sort of environment when there's such a significant crackdown at home against independent media, civil society, uh, by Vladimir uh, Putin and this uh, significant apparent insecurity uh, by this regime, which is causing them to lash out in every direction to try to preserve their grip on, on power. And so I think the, the, the next several uh, years look and increasingly dire from that perspective. On, on this issue, a question from Johannes Alefeld. Uh, what do you make of current Russian law designating certain institutions such as RFERL officially as foreign agents and forbidding corporations with them. We covered that uh, and Daisy earlier covered as well in part, but further, is there a trend in Central um, um, Eastern Europe and other regions that increasingly authoritarian governments copy the Russian approach and what do, uh, can we do to counter such a trend? I think Daisy can, can cover this. I, I think the, the answer is we've certainly unfortunately seen that trend, but Daisy can, can talk a little bit more about what we've seen uh, even during the pandemic um, along these lines. Yeah, I mean, I think that the example that jumps out for me most markedly is, uh, is Belarus, which has um, basically used a Russian um, template for dealing with foreign media down to the letter to the degree that they are soon to pass their own version of a foreign agent law inside Belarus. I mentioned earlier that they had deprived foreign media, foreign funded media organizations of accreditations. Uh, in Belarus, you cannot work as a journalist openly on the street without accreditation, so it effectively drives uh, journalists underground. As I mentioned, we've seen that also play out um, to, pretty, uh, to a pretty effective degree in a number of Central Asian countries where we work, particularly Tajikistan uh, and to some degree Kazakhstan. But even in, um, in places that are relatively new for us and part of the European Union, like Hungary, we are seeing uh, a rising uh, pressure campaign against our very newly launched service in Hungary, um, where Viktor Orban will be facing a very critical uh, election season next year. Um, Deutsche Welle recently returned to Hungary, and so we are seeing a number of campaigns that seek to vilify foreign funded media by associating them with the principles of liberal democracy that they associate with the European Union, uh, migration and other issues that are, uh, that are frequently used as a cudgel uh, by the government in Hungary. What we are doing in individual countries to counter uh, the influence will vary, but something that we've uh, just begun that we are, are find very interesting and very hopeful is working on trust principles in a number of countries where we work. And so uh, those of you who follow media trends are probably very aware of things like the Trusted News Initiative, um, but basically, it, uh, it puts the onus on the media organization to be more transparent about its editorial policy, to be transparent about its corrections policy, and to create more of a corridor for conversation between the audience and the media organization, even down to trolls who will be, who have already proven themselves to be very sophisticated, uh, very adept. At, uh, at challenging our work on social media platforms in the countries where we work. The more transparent we are about our operations, uh, the less grounds they have for making claims of uh, poor performance on our part. And so we have begun working specifically on trust principles with regards to our Hungarian audience, which after all is quite new. We only relaunched last October. Um, and it's essential to us uh, in the run-up to the elections next year that we uh, 
communicate with our audience in Hungary about who we are, what our values are, where our funding comes from, and what the source of our editorial independence is. And that is a conversation that we're seeking to increase with all of our audiences in all of the countries where we work. Thank you. While we were talking, we had one more tribute coming in, this one from Thomas Ilves, uh, director of the Estonian service from 1988 to 1993, uh, and of course then president of Estonia from 2006 to 16. Quote, I will always be grateful to Ross for listening to the wild ideas of a 30 something director of the Estonian service from 1988 to 1993. I was the first RFE RL person to visit Estonia, indeed then the U USSR, to begin to use freelancers from the target country while it was still occupied, to be the first service to open an office on the territory of the then USSR, as well as allowing our enormous phone bills that were at the core of our life coverage when no one else was doing it. All of this was possible because Ross trusted me and stood up to Washington where all of my activities were considered unconventional to say the least. Thank you so much. We're quickly running out of time. Let me uh, bring up a question. I think this one is also um, probably for Daisy. Do you get a lot of video material from the audience from regions which are not covered by journalists on the ground? We do, and uh, this is really a path forward for us in countries that are closing to the work of journalists operating out in the open. And we, we had a very interesting experiment a few months ago. Um, so I've mentioned several times the inability of our journalists inside Belarus to walk openly down the street with a camera. It simply is not possible for them anymore, uh, at least not without running the risk of detention. Uh, so we put out a call on our platforms for uh, home videos and user generated content of protests, of examples of uh, police brutality. Um, which was absolutely rampant in Belarus over, you know, from the from the election onward. Um, and we were hoping to get you know, perhaps 100 videos or so. We got uh, hundreds and hundreds of videos that were astonishingly vivid, um, you know, inside uh, trade unions as they were casting their personal vote for who they wanted as president. Um, examples of uh, police dragging taxi drivers out of their cars and beating them in full view of uh, protesters. Uh, and we had such good and vivid content that we were able to produce an entire feature length documentary on the protest season in Belarus without a single of our own camera operators uh, providing any footage. And uh, it's an astonishing piece of work. It's actually available in English for those of you who might be interested in seeing it. Um, and again, this is a path forward for us because we are not always going to be able to film openly on the street, but we know that there are committed observers, eyewitnesses to history in all of the countries where we live who are more than willing to provide and share their content with us. So um, that's been a really exciting uh, experiment for us and one that we're definitely going to be pursuing further. Thank you. One more tribute to Ross from Peter Rutland, professor of government at Wesleyan University. RFERL has for many decades been a crucial source of expertise and information about the former Soviet Union. Mainstream media and academic centers in the US cut back their coverage in the 1990s. So RFERL continues to play a vital role in forming public knowledge about this region. I think it was a tribute also to RFERL. Um, let me um, perhaps close with the final question uh, as we're running out of time um, uh, by Andy Cattell, a retired journalist, former Moscow correspondent for the AP. Has there been any consideration of trying to collaborate with Russian state media on stories, something in common that might facilitate goodwill building? 
I'll, I'll start and then Daisy will probably have more history. Um, I don't think in, in the, in right now in the current environment that likely to happen. We do have some humorous anecdotes though, just from the last several months where some of the Russian state TV outlets uh, actually picked up some of our content. I believe it was from our current time channel and aired it and they subsequently were fined <laughs> for uh, airing that content uh, because they did not correctly note that it was produced by a foreign agent. So uh, they were fined, the, the state sponsored outlets were actually fined by their own government, which just goes to show what the current environment is uh, right now. I mean, we're open to cooperation uh, in, in all of the countries where we work, uh, but we have been blocked from the airwaves for the most part in Russia now uh, for much of the Putin era. Uh, lost our radio uh, licenses, uh, we have never been able to put this amazing TV channel current time on sat satellite packages that reach the Russian audience. And so I think we're unfortunately moving in a direction away from potential cooperation with any uh, Russian state uh, outlets. And uh, we're increasingly the targets of a lot of propaganda uh, from the Kremlin. Uh, often aired on those outlets. And so cooperation is not likely in the near term, but Daisy may know if there were any uh, past uh, examples of cooperation that were, that were more positive. Um, there haven't been, um, but as Jamie noted earlier, something that's been very interesting is that, you know, the, the video that I showed, you know, really emphasizes our news reporting capabilities, but something that we've also gotten incredibly good at is documentary work and feature programming that puts, uh, tells really compelling human stories from inside Russia. They're astonishing. They're reported from deep inside Russia. They're beautifully shot. They're very human. Um, very compelling. And these are the only programs that we have been able to produce that get picked up by affiliates inside Russia. They are um, so, um, so compelling and so non-political in a sense because they are about ordinary people and their lives uh, that they have, they're deemed unobjectionable. Uh, even by affiliates that have that are highly dependent on contracts with state advertisers and the like. So we have been able to get that kind of content onto television airwaves inside Russia. They are often cited and picked up during television talk shows run on state channels. So you will occasionally see our brand up there. You'll see some of our content up there without necessarily a snarky remark of some kind. Um, because the kind of storytelling that we're able to do inside Russia is unlike anything that state television is doing itself. And that's not just in terms of the news, but this very human storytelling. So that's been kind of an interesting moment in terms of the Achilles heel when it comes to the Russia media mindset that somehow we were able to crack this nut faster than a very moneyed, very sophisticated um, media mechanism inside Russia. They somehow had forgotten that uh, people are interested in stories about themselves. So that has been a really interesting moment for us. But, you know, when it comes to seeking partners inside Russia, I would say that we're looking for uh, like-minded organizations who are equally under the gun. So talk, talking about Medusa or TV Rain, the very few independent media organizations that still function inside Russia um, and are coming under increasing pressure. These are the people who are our natural partners inside Russia. And I think our, our history, our brand, our legacy, and our capacity for incredible storytelling makes us a very good home uh, for smaller and more disadvantaged, um, partners with even greater disadvantages than we have. So I think in the months and years ahead, what we're really gonna be looking to do is partner with small investigative outlets and other news organizations that are still fighting by, you know, by hook or by crook to stay operational inside Russia. Thank you. I'm afraid we're at the end of our time and uh, apologies to those of you whose uh, questions we could not get to. Uh, let me thank Jamie Fly and Daisy Sindelar for a really wonderful, fascinating conversation about the legacy and impact of RFERL and Ross Johnson's role in all of this. We all owe him and, uh, are greatly indebted to him and to miss him, as I think becomes clear uh, throughout these uh, remarks. Thank you to my colleagues at the Kennan Institute, Morgan Jacobs and the Wilson Center's uh, AV 
staff, and thank you uh, to our audience for your questions, comments, and tributes. We're adjourned. Be safe. Take care.